Okay. All right. I mean, thanks. Uh, thanks for coming down to New America today and and uh, coming down here to discuss your new book. Uh, you're very and welcome. Good to be back in DC. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Well, I um yeah, and congratulations on the book too. I I, I had a chance to, to to read through some of it over the weekend, and uh, and and I think that it's it's uh, fantastic, and I think that it'll make a uh, an interesting sort of. Perhaps shift the policy debate now as, as we're really getting into trying to, to flesh out who the Taliban are and what the Taliban are. Um, I, I, real quick, I'll introduce myself and then let you introduce yourself and then let you talk about the book a bit. Um, okay. My name is Nicholas Schmidl. I'm a fellow at the New America Foundation and uh, a journalist. I spent a couple of years in Pakistan in 06 and 07 and uh, had just written a story about the Taliban, about the sort of next generation Taliban, published in the New York Times Magazine in the first week of January, and uh, two days later the Pakistani government received uh, my story so well that, that they issued my wife and I a deportation order and we were asked to leave. So um, with that being said, I'll let you now introduce yourself, and, and if you want to just kind of talk about the book for a few minutes, and um, if there's anything sort of new to add that you want to discuss, and then we can do, we can kind of engage in some chat. Okay, great. Uh, well, my name is Amin Tazi. I'm the Director of Middle East Studies at the United States Marine Corps University in Quantico, just south of here. And uh, uh, the book, uh, my dealing with Afghanistan goes back uh, quite a bit, actually about 25 years. Uh, I, for a short while I was an Afghan diplomat when uh, Rabani took over in 1992. Mm. Uh, as a U.S. citizen in those days, that didn't seem to matter, uh, and, and UN, and then uh, I worked for about three and a half years as an advisor, political advisor to the Saudi government, uh, dealing partially with Afghanistan, what was called then, uh, this is 93 to 96, uh, what was called the Friends of Afghanistan. Basically, that was uh, a five countries, five members of the UN meeting with the Secretary General or with uh, uh, with uh, the political officers in at the UN, uh, these countries were the United States, uh, Soviet Union, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and Iran. These were the friends of Afghanistan, mm -hmm. the so-called informal group. Those of you know the six plus two, that basically came out of that. So my involvement in Afghanistan got much closer during that that period, which I was working with could Saudi. Just, which could also you just uh, since we're, we're kind of looking yeah. for average people, if you could just explain explain to what six plus two is. 6 plus 2 is a mechanism that at the time it was created to basically in, in order to expand the friends group, a group of countries which was helping Afghanistan come out of its uh, turmoil, the post-Soviet withdrawal, post-collapse of communist government, basically in fighting between the Mujahideen groups uh, or the, you know, the people who took over in 92. And 6 plus 2, uh, the formula was the six neighbors of Afghanistan, which was China, Pakistan, Iran, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, plus the Russian Federation and the United States. The reason that formula was adopted was because, and when we had our not, you know, the, the, the not secret but more uh, talks that were at the UN, uh, there was a notion to expand the group to help the Afghans, and Pakistan always objected to the inclusion of India. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the formula six plus two came in that expanded the group of the, fi the five so-called friends, but it excluded India. So uh, the 6 plus 2 group worked uh, within the UN organization, also outside of the UN, uh, and it dissolved basically after the Bonn Agreement. So that was basically the mechanism, the international mechanism that helped various warring factions in Afghanistan try to solve the issues. And unfortunately, I may add that some of these 6 plus 2 actually also paid either directly uh, and money or arms to the to the fighting, so they were in a way solving a problem that they were yeah, yeah. partially creating, which is which is kind of interesting. So that that's what I did with Afghanistan. Then uh, I lived in Uzbekistan for a while in '96, and that's when I actually became a bit involved more with the uh, with the group that is now called the Northern Alliance. Uh, uh, and uh, so I traveled in northern Afghanistan for the first time since the Soviet invasion. Uh, and then uh, for about four years, I worked as the Afghan analyst at uh, RFERL, Lady Free Europe, Lady Liberty, uh, both in Prague and then here in Washington, D.C. So that's my background. And actually, the book comes out of the time when I was with the RFERL. Uh, the book is actually uh, the product of a conference that Professor Bob Cruz, who is my co-editor in this uh, volume, 
uh, he uh, invited a number of Afghan experts uh, in 19, uh, sorry, in 2004 in Stanford, California, uh, to discuss uh, what was happening, the, what we were talking about at the time, the new Taliban, what are they, because it, 2004 is when people realize that the Taliban are back. Right. Uh, so the conference was basically looking at the phenomena of the Taliban as we knew them and what was happening to explain to uh, to the Stanford community at the time, basically, to what was going on and on the on the ground, and uh, the conference we believe went well enough that uh, uh, Bob Cruz, it's his initiative. I have to give him credit. He he said, "Why not gather some of these papers and, and make a, a, a volume?" Uh, the volume that Harvard published uh, in January. Yes, that, okay. yes. Uh, the volume is actually uh, is. Partially, papers that were presented at that particular conference at, at uh, Stanford, and partially new, new. Actually, there are two additional uh, articles that came out from the outside to people who actually were not there. Uh, so that's the that's the byproduct of that conference, and it took a long time. So, uh, what you see in that book is a reflection of what has happened in 2004 all the way up to uh, late 07. Mm -hmm. So it covers. Uh, I mean, there, there's historical issues in there too, but but most of them were written initially in 2004. Then, of course, expanded as we went uh, in the publication process. Fantastic. Well, let me ask you two questions actually about uh, your introduction that that grabbed my attention before we get into talking about the book too much. You mentioned as part of the the, the six plus two that both the Iranians, uh, the Iranians and the Americans were both involved, and a number of them were funding um, groups that were involved in the fighting. Was there at any point uh, was there was there a point in time when when the Iranians and the Americans were in fact funding the same mujahideen factions? Uh, yes, there was some time it was happening, and actually they were they were the the, the, the friends group, and later on the six plus two were the, one of the few venues where where United States and Iran actually met semi officially. I say semi officially because there were officials of these countries, but there was no some such a thing uh, you know a six plus two meeting where cameras were rolling. Right. Uh, so, and, and I can tell you as a, on a personal level, when, when the Friends Group, Friends again, I repeat, is the five countries at the time, uh, this is from 93 to 94, 5, basically, it kind of, it was never an official group, it was an informal group to aid the Secretary General at the time, Boutros, Boutros Ghali, uh, and, and, and that grouping, uh, it was very informal, as I said, there's nothing secret in the UN, but it was very, very informal, we met kind of in, a, in the map room, basically upstairs in the UN building. Uh, and there you had uh, Madeleine Albright was the US uh, ambassador to the UN and, and Kamal Kharazi was the Iranian ambassador. Mm -hmm. Both later on became their respective countries as foreign ministers right. or secretary of state. And I remember those days that we were actually, I was kind of, as a Saudi, uh, I was a Saudi diplomat, again with the US passport, uh, I was the go-between between, between mm -hmm. them. And then at the time, the Iranians and the U.S. was working much more closer, uh, and the biggest hurdle, I should say, not a problem, but the hurdle was was how to uh, how to bring in the Pakistanis, then uh, because the Pakistanis were becoming more and more agitated with the government in Kabul at the time, the Rabani government. Mm -hmm. So it was a very interesting period. One day I have time, I'll actually write about that. I have pretty much most of the documents from those That's days. Fascinating. Of what happened. So when six plus two came in, yes, the U.S. is, is the U.S. At, at one point decided that with once the, you know the Taliban was seen as a as a problem mainly because of their uh, uh, relationship with Al Qaeda, uh, there was aid going to to again what we call uh, traditionally Northern Alliance, although that's not their real name, but who, right now everybody calls them Northern Alliance, uh, and the Iranians always supported the Northern Alliance. Right. Uh, you know, this is another misconception. People always think, oh, the Iranians, the Shia, definitely they were supporting people like Wahdat. Wahdat was supported only those factions that accepted the, the Northern Alliance agreement. The Wahdat people who did not accept that were actually being, uh, one of the complaints of the Afghan Shia was that, you know, here's bullets that are raining to us from Ahmad Shah Massoud. Which are actually support given by Iran. So there was this. Could you could you uh, could you explain a little bit about who Wahdat is? Okay, Hezb Wahdat it basically means unity. It's called Hezb Wahdat the Islami of Afghanistan, right. the Islamic uh, the Islamic Unity Party of Afghanistan. It's an Iranian-made party. It was actually in Iran uh, during the 
jihad period. By jihad period, I mean from 1980 until 1992. These are, this is the period, the 12 years, where the Afghans were fighting against either first against the communist government in Kabul and later on against the Soviets. Right. Uh, and there were seven main parties in Pakistan. Pakistan decided that they will only have seven parties. You had to register through those seven parties. Otherwise, you wouldn't get any aid. Right. And more importantly, as a refugee, you need to carry you need to carry one of the parties cards. So Pakistan basically recognized seven parties, and those were the only seven that that had legitimacy in Pakistan. Whereas in Iran, there were uh, I mean, I have a book that shows 160 parties officially with their logos and everything. Really? So later on, Iranians decided uh, in 1988, 89, the Iranians held a conference and they united all these parties or at least by name, or, or partially actually in fact they did. And that is what is called the hezb Wahdat. So it was basically a coalition, Iranian forged coalition of mainly, actually pretty much predominantly Shia parties in Afghanistan. Ah. And that is what is called the hezb Wahdat. And, and uh, the turn of events is interesting. When the Taliban were approaching Kabul in 1996, uh, uh, those of people who know Afghanistan more, they, they recall that the only main leader of Afghan opposition, I mean, Afghan political party was killed was uh, Abdul Ali Mazari, who was the head of the Wahdat party. He was killed by the Taliban in a, in a kind of a mysterious situ- situation. Uh, the Taliban made a deal with, 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 the, with the Wahdat. Wahdat was actually being beat, being bombarded by Massoud's forces. Mm. And at, this is the time that the Iranians actually were supporting uh, elements of the Northern Alliance, mainly those who were allied to Ahmad Shah Massoud, uh, who were fighting against their own creation, the Wahdat Party, mm. which also comes, you know, if I fast forward to, to, let's say today, when some of us look at Iranians helping what I call the neo-Taliban, uh, people say, oh, you know, some of the first reaction is, you know, they hate each other, these are very staunch Sunnis, the Taliban are, and the Iranians are Shias, and, you know, how can they help each other? I always point, the first thing I point to people is that first, in the Afghan game, or in most political games, it is, it is not really so much about ethnicity or religion, it's more about interest. Right. And if the Iranian interest is to help a group, whether it be Sunni or Shia, they will do that, for short term or long term. Uh, and I also always point out that Gulbuddin Hikmatyar, who is as staunch Sunni as they, they come in Afghanistan, maybe the only person who's more radical than he in the, in the leadership would be uh, Sayyaf. Uh, he was, you know, after the Taliban kicked him out, he, he lived in, in Tehran, right. so... Um, well, you know, let's talk about the Neo-Taliban a little bit. You know, one of the, one of the um, distinguishing features of your account of the Neo-Taliban in, in the book is one of the things is its lack of organizational unity and all these splinter groups. Could you, uh, do you feel like there is more unity to the resistance and the, the neo-Taliban now than there was when you when you wrote that story or write, wrote that article? Uh, no, I think, I think there's still, there is a lack of unity which actually makes them more, uh, more of a challenge in my view. Uh, the, I, I do not believe that there is a table somewhere where these what we call the Taliban or neo-Taliban, and I'll get back one minute from why I why I you know use that term, is that they sit down and strategize. Mm. Uh, I I think now there's even more diverse. Mm. There are groups within that organization, whatever we want to call them, uh, that are more organized now uh, in certain areas. But overall, the opposition. Let, let's put it this way: the the armed opposition that is opposing the go- government in Kabul. The central government, right now led by by Hamid Karzai, is, a, in my view, still very disunited. Uh, not not that they are disunited; they are not even uh, they, they, they are they're fractionized. Mm. It's not because it is something that used to be together now they have parted. That has happened, but mainly there are different groups that have taken either directly the name of the Taliban or. We from the outside have given the name the Taliban, or just because there is no other name, right. that has just come on them. And that's why one reason I, I use the word neo-Taliban is not to create another term in Washington. We have a lot of nomenclatures. And by the way, it's not my invention. Right. Neo-Taliban was very first time I saw it was actually in an article by a good friend of mine, uh, Jonathan Ledger of uh, The Economist. I knew Jonathan because he, he and I lived in Prague together, and I had a little thing to do to, for him to go to Afghanistan. So I would see his articles and I knew it was him because the economist doesn't write the name of their right, correspondence. Right. 
uh, uh, so Jonathan first used it. He never really followed it. And then I wrote him, I said, Jonathan, I really want to use this because I don't think what we are dealing with right now, this is we are talking in 2003, 2002, these are not the Taliban. These are not the same people that were defeated in, in, in October till December 2001. This is a new phenomenon. And uh, he said, sure, go ahead, use it. So that's the term that I kind of popularized it while I was at RFERL. Uh, not, again, to be cute, but because I wanted to make sure, in order to confront an enemy, whether from a military perspective, whether if you want to just understand it as an academic or as a reporter or as a political person, as anyway, you, unless you don't, you know, if you don't know who you're dealing with, right. how can you confront them or, or, or uh, even try to uh, defeat them or join them or, 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 or uh, understand them? And I think the pr- biggest problem still exists. When you go to Kabul, the term you use is enemies of peace and security. Right. Obviously, anybody who blows up her or himself and kills people is an enemy of peace and security. Right. That, that, that's a cop-out. I think the Afghan government doesn't want to say who they are because they are partially in this, in this problem. They're part of the problem. Right. Uh, <clears throat> initially, we, we, for lack of a better word, the, the, you know, the, the international community, those who help Afghanistan, they call them uh, terrorists. Oh, well, they don't call them terrorists because the Taliban are not considered terrorists, which is another amazing phenomenon. Anybody else does what they do, which is suicide bombing, killing people, innocent people in markets, targeting absolutely civilians, right. and targeting, of course, Western sources would be considered a terrorist, but somehow they are not. Well, do you think that that's because um, the United States is trying to leave the door open to potentially negotiate or engage in some sort of dialogue with the Taliban at some point down the line? Could be now. Initially, it was just because nobody, again, knew what, what to do with mm-hmm. them. Uh, we had, in the United States in particular, at the time, uh, individual members of the former Taliban group were considered to be terrorists, uh, namely Mullah Omar. He has still a $25 million uh, right. you know, uh, bounty on his head, basically. Right. But, but as a whole, the organization is not in the list. Could be that, because even from the day that we were going in, into Afghanistan, there was this notion, and I think that's the, the chapter that precedes my chapter in the book, which is uh, Bob Cruz's chapter about the modern Taliban, right. whether or not there are people within, the, within the, 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 the classical Taliban, by that I mean the regime that was ousted in 2001, whether you could talk with them. And the question to that is yes. Mm. And if you look at that, even there, there were a lot of uh, uh, discrepancies or I would say lack of coordination between the foreign efforts to incorporate or bring these people into the Afghan government and the Afghan government, mm. uh, both from Mr. Karzai's side uh, and, of course, the elements of Northern Alliance who are totally opposed to any any reconciliation with, with any element of well, the Well, let conflict. me ask you this. I, um, I was going to save the, the, the questions about dialogue with the Taliban until the end of our discussion, but since we're already there, why don't we talk about it? Um, the... Uh, you know, last November, I believe, maybe December, uh, a representative of the EU, um, who was the special advisor to, to the, or the, is it the EU or the European Commission? And the special advisor was uh, apparently handing suitcases of money to the Taliban in Helmand and then was, was quickly expelled from the country. Um, and... and that, that's the that's the Irish right fellow. exactly right and yeah. you know and, and the Awami National Party over on the other side of the border in Pakistan ha- has talked about since being elected in the, uh, after the February 18th elections has talked about trying to also engage with the Taliban and and using dialogue to sort of ferret out and limit the influence of the foreign elements in the tribal areas the foreign elements being the primarily Arabs Chechens Uzbek Al Qaeda foreign terrorist types. Um, some argue that this is merely a way of buying time, that the Taliban are using this as a way of buying time. Do you see this as being a, a viable way to sort of, to, to isolate the moderate Taliban and to sort of weed out the, the foreign elements that are seen as being the most destructive? Uh, very, very important issue, yes. Uh, my view is what I see, not my view. Let's put that, make it. First of all, let us go to Pakistan. The Taliban, as we know it, the resurgent Taliban could not have existed with the force they are in Afghanistan unless there was support within the Pakistani establishment for them. You mean, and when we say Pakistani establishment, army, military, intelligence agencies, 
and, pl- and, uh, and all, all of all of the above. Uh, uh, yes, they have a lot of support within the military. Uh, I would say the army, not the military, mm-hmm. the army. Uh, they have support within the within the uh, military intelligence, but also they have support within within the government structure. Mm-hmm. Now the question is. Why and also what is the difference between the, what we call the Taliban and what we call the Al Qaeda? I think uh, all the way from Mr. Uh, President Musharraf downwards, there's a distinction made in Pakistan between these two elements. Mm-hmm. Uh, at, well, there are some people who may even like elements of Al Qaeda, but but overall in Pakistan, the Pakistani government has made a concerted effort to fight Al Qaeda. Right. By Al Qaeda, I mean anybody who's not an Afghan or a Pakistani. Right. The Chechens, the Arabs, the the, the the Uzbeks, and so on and so right. forth, they are seen as a as a a threat. And when Pakistan joins us in the war against you know the, the global war against terror, uh, or what we call the long war, they are sincere in that. They are fighting. They have maybe the best leaders of the the Al Qaeda, or we have got an after nine eleven. That's all through Pakistan. Sure. Uh, but when it comes to local well, now they have their own name, Tahrik Taliban in Pakistan, uh, the TTP. There is another issue. As one is the local Taliban, which the Pakistanis are now worried about, but initially the Taliban in Afghanistan or the neo-Taliban. My view is that for Pakistan's strategic interest, whether it is confronting India or influence of India and Afghanistan, but most importantly, having a government in Afghanistan that is not opposed to Pakistan. Opposed meaning opposed to Pakistan's existence as a country. For that, they need a, a, a sort of a pressure point in Afghanistan. That pressure point, unfortunately for Pakistan, they don't have the historical... They, historically, they are a much younger country than Afghanistan. Right. The only thing they have is they always look at themselves as the vanguards of Islam, whereas Afghanistan is not. That's why most of the madrasas in Afghanistan were closed by the Taliban, in a way. They become the, the viability of Islam in the region becomes, becomes Pakistan's prerogative. Thus, there is a, an effort, in my view, to Islamicize the groups in Afghanistan, rather Pashtunize, to, to replace Pashtunism, which is Afghan nationalism, which claims half of Pakistan, mm-hmm. And all, you know, pretty much all of the northwest frontier province and Baluchistan as part of Afghanistan, mm-hmm. to to replace that with Islamism, which what, what will happen is that then in the future Afghanistan, whatever Afghanistan regime, whatever regime it has, it will be basically looking towards Pakistan for identity because the identity will be Islamic rather than Pashtun. Right. Because as long as a Pashtun ide- ideology sits, Pakistan sees itself threatened. Not that Afghanistan has the military power to attack Af- Pakistan. Mm-hmm. But always there's a nag, and in my view, I think the world, the world meaning the countries involved in Afghanistan, lost a, a golden opportunity in the in Bonn not to make sure that one of the things in the Bonn agreement would have been that Afghanistan has no claim to Pakistan. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, today that you see the Afghan government all the way from from the ministers, they still claim that 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 ridiculous idea that, you know, the other side of the border is part of Af- Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. You even see things to the point, you know, an Afghan official media, Anis, which is the, the Dali language Afghan official media, saying that, you know, once the United States and our allies give us the, our forces, we'll go back and raise our flag in Peshawar. Mm-hmm. Not that they can do that, but if you're a Pakistani, yeah. you need something to confront that. So th- this is my, what a, it's very simple, it's beyond that, but one thing is, is you know, there's ethnic issues, there's uh, money issue, there's a lot of drunk business, there's a lot of businesses. That's why the neo-Taliban, in my view, is not just a bunch of militants. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of drug dealing involved in it, there's a lot of uh, uh, tribal... Well, there's banditry, as we see now, with the kidnapping but, of the uh, the Pakistani ambassador to Afghanistan, right. who, you know, two yeah. months ago um, w- w- was kidnapped and all of a sudden now is shown up on a videotape and the right. Taliban are demanding that, that they release all of these militants in exchange right. for the ambassador. And that, unfortunately, again, you know, we are jumping up and down from everything. Uh, you have to thank the Italians for that. Mm. Uh, you know, once you give in and, and, you know, give money and give in and the Koreans for that matter. Yeah. And, uh, and, and once you give in to, to the demands of a terrorist, uh, and I call them terrorists because anybody who kidnaps a uh, civilian and demands ransom, if not, they'll cut their heads, uh, that is a terrorist. Yeah. And, and, and when the Italians gave 
after two Afghans, one was killed and the other was killed later, uh, for one, one journalist they gave money and they forced the Afghans to release five very known uh, neo-Taliban uh, members. You know what? The message is unfortunately very sad that, uh, uh, you know, that you basically get, uh, uh, you get, uh, you, you capture a good, high, ta- you know, high value target, whether it's a foreigner, any foreigner is high value, or in the case of the, the poor ambassador, he's, he's a, you know, an official, then you can get your way. Well, and as we saw yesterday um, in Pakistan, the, uh, the government released Sufi Muhammad, who, who was the, the initial founder of the Tariq i Nafash Shariat Muhammadiyya, which is one of, these, one of these militant outfits based in the Northwest Frontier province. They released the founder, who uh, after 2001, after the American invasion, took 10,000, some, ten, some odd 10,000 madrasa students across the border into Afghanistan to fight the Americans returned with, with a very small amount, enough that the, the, the parents of these, of these you know, dead students you know, essentially complained to the government and had the guy arrested. So now, while he has, in the past few years, come to look more and more moderate, nonetheless, this guy was released yesterday as, as uh, one would assume, part of this, part of this uh, negotiation and trade-off to get the ambassador back. If we could, uh, but if, if, we, if we want to just jump back to the, the notion of the dialogue issue, yes. Um, do you think that there are, are there are there elements that can be isolated and that can be talked to and that can ultimately um, work to to America, Afghanistan, and Pakistan's interests? I think so. Yes, I, I think there is always a, a, a opportunity. People are people in the world. I think, and I'm I'm ethnically a Pashtun. I'm, I'm a Durrani from from uh, the Barak Zai Muhammad Zai tribe. So I you know I can I can tell you as a human being, we are you know Pashtuns are no different than anybody else. They're human beings, and if their their interests are met, I think there is always an opportunity to do that. I think my 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 issue with it is that. These three countries you just mentioned, the United States of America, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, have to, at the government level, have to see eye to mm-hmm. eye. The problem is that the United States sees eye to eye with Afghanistan, the United States sees eye to eye partially with Pakistan, but when the three of us get together, uh, unfortunately, the two of Pakistan and Afghanistan do not see eye to eye. These two countries, and this is a big dilemma for any U.S. interlocutor, we have two allies in the war against terror, which basically are not allies of each other. They're not. They're far from it. And then, as long as that issue is not solved, that these two countries and I, you know, here's the attempt should not be to make Afghanistan and Pakistan love each other and be bosom buddies and and no, no, that's not needed. That that is hopeful, but that's not needed. What is needed, in my view, is that these two countries recognize each other as viable sovereign states with a viable borders. Once you establish that, then you can go on and, and, and have a give and take of you know what you can give and what you can take and how to view the opposition. Because right now the opposition is viewed differently from Islamabad's perspective and Kabul's perspective. Right. And as long as that's there, I think talking is very dangerous because it's not that the talking itself is bad, but the parameters are, are such that it will help the the the, the people who are on the ground, meaning the, the militants, neo-Taliban, whatever you want to call mm-hmm. them. The only time that a talking like that would help is when, when, when the side of table here being, whether it's the United States or let us hope that it will be ISAF as a whole, so NATO. You have NATO, Pakistan, Afghanistan sitting firmly on one side, and then, then you look at the other side and say, okay, now we are looking for moderates. These are the, these are the notions that what we believe moderation is. Does your does, do your interactions with the American military? Do you feel like it is within that it would be tolerable, if you will, after six years of fighting the Taliban, that the American military would sign off and say, "Okay, it's all right to to engage and and to to uh, you know have some dialogue with some of these groups," or or after six years of being shot at, are they just saying, you know, screw this? I mean, is this purely a political push, or is there some military push too? Uh, I don't want to speculate on what would happen on the ground. I don't think there is a problem to, to and this is my own view, uh, there is a problem in the U.S. military to, to engage these people if they meet certain criteria. Yeah, you don't think there's a problem? If they no, don't. I don't think there's a problem. I do not think there's a problem that these people, with Al-Qaeda, yes, there is a problem, mm-hmm. but not with the Taliban. Mm-hmm. And no, of course, again, there's, see, the U.S., officially, we only have very few people on the list that people that are not to be... Uh, 
dealt with, and there's like eight people, that's it. Or, or the larger list, which nobody has seen, is 150 people. But the main main issue is, I don't think there's a problem. It's, it's in Afghanistan, too, the, the problem with Kabul, I, I believe that the problem lies right now not so much in the Western or NATO realm. NATO does some, some things that are, are out of out of the blue. I mean, the whole issue with the with, with Musa Qalla, whether that was wise or not, you know, we can discuss that. But could you, uh, just, could you explain a little bit? Oh, sorry, a little bit about what happened in Musa Qalla? Well, it was it was a, a it was a deal done uh, between uh, at the time the British uh, who were in in uh, in uh, Musa Qalla, which is a, a city in Hilman, the northern Hilman province, uh, which is in southern Afghanistan. Uh, and the locals, and uh, so that that the locals would not allow the Taliban to establish uh, rule, and also that they will allow, uh, they will also not allow the foreigners to be there. So basically, it was a, a it was a truce, and, and it worked to some degrees, and then it stopped. It didn't work, and when it didn't work, there was actually a a, a military uh, takeover of Helma uh, of Musaqala, which has now been complete, and the Afghan government is back in okay. there. Uh, this has been seen both ways. I think. I think any deal that is done, and this is the crucial thing. This is a very complicated situation to begin with. But if your interlocutors on one side, here I am talking about ISAF, Afghan, Pakistani, and Pakistan has to be included. This is not only an Afghan issue. Right. If that border was not there, if there was, let us say, there was ocean on the other side of the what was called the Huron Line, but the Afghan-Pakistani border. I think we would have not had a Taliban problem. Mm. Simple as that. So the fact that we do not have an ocean there, uh, you have you have the tribal areas in Pakistan. This is an issue which is has to be dealt with with ISAF. And again, it's not United States. I people have to understand that it, Helmand is right now basically still British. In Kandahar, you have the Canadians. It, it is all these countries that are involved. So it should be first of all that we all have to meet eye to eye, which we we more or less do. Mm. And we, as I said before, we more or less see eye to eye with, with our interlocutors in Kabul and Islamabad, more or less, not fully. But somehow Kabul and Islamabad has to be brought into the table. As long as that's not happening, I think in the long run, the people who win are the people who have arms and they're trying to create tension because this is what the issue, the tension is not only created by a group of militants who want a more, you know, uh, Islamist I, you know, ideology to prevail, uh, the Sharia, the Islamic jurisprudence to prevail. But there are also people who want maybe autonomy. There are people who want to protect drug grounds. Mm-hmm. There are people who you are know, talking about billions of dollars. There are people who want to protect uh, territories where where, where uh, narcotics I mean basically poppy is cultivated. You are talking about people who are not seeing the Kabul government as a government that is supporting the Pashtun cause. Right. They are, and these are all the issues that are, are, are coming up. And all these people, these, and then they are just pure criminals. Mm. You know, uh, some of the or, or people who want to. You know, I, one, one one note I always point to people uh, when they they talk about. You know who are the Taliban or who are these killers? Uh, an incident which is which is which is very unfortunate. Uh, an incident that involved the Médecins Sans Frontières, the Doctors Without Borders, mm-hmm. in Badris in northern Afghanistan, mm-hmm. where two uh, I think there were two a Norwegian and a Belgian and two or three Afghans were killed, uh, and the Taliban. Claim responsibility. Everybody said, "Oh, that was the Taliban." Later on, of course, we knew that it had nothing to do with the Taliban. It was a local commander, and a long story. But he basically had said, "If you fire me, there will be uh, a lot of uh, violence here." And he was fired. And there you well, go. Even in Pakistan, over the course of the, of the two years that I was there, I found it fascinating that that is down in down outside of North and South Waziristan, it was increasing where you know some guy who who was a bomber or, or just a bandit or, or really a no good criminal one day would suddenly start growing his beard put on a black turban and you know take his gun and and the next day be this 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 Taliban fighter with this sort of halo around his head that that right. you know all of a sudden he had the moral high ground whereas the day before he was being scoffed at exactly that's a very good point you're making the name Taliban, and this is another thing that why I call I do not want to call them the Taliban. We may in the West think, you know, we see the movies and say, oh, the Taliban, these bad guys, they you know they blew up the Buddhas right. and they they put women into chains. Right. Oh, these are very very bad people. In the region we are dealing with, within the Pashtuns, with not all the Pashtuns, but within a a a, a 
good number of the Pashtuns. And even with the non-Pashtuns, the Taliban are not such a bad people. No, definitely not. And this is an issue that now, as you say, the criminal can, can gather up a few, like four people. And you know what we call them? A commander. Mm-hmm. That's another thing. The names that we give them, give them more identity and more prestige. A commander, what is a commander? A commander could be two people. And this is why people say, oh, there are 400 Taliban commanders were at the one place. Yes, that may have been 600 people. Yeah. Because each commander could be commander of himself or maybe commander of himself and, and his, his subordinate. Uh, th- this is why, uh, again, you really don't see a good command and control situation of the Taliban because they don't. And we as a military, we are not trained still after, you know, we, we are now how six, seven years in coin in the counterinsurgency operations. We still haven't learned how to look at the other side because we are a much more organized major military. We are changing rapidly, and I think we are learning uh, on the ground, which is not the best way to do, but we are learning very fast, and I think very effective. That's why we are effective. Well, let's, talk, let's talk command and control for a second. You know, you mentioned earlier that you don't, you don't buy the notion that there is this sort of organized structure where everyone sits down and around a table. You know, there, there are obviously a number of, of theories as to how the insurgency is being orchestrated right now. There's the one that, that the, this Quetta Shura, which, which is, you know, a group of people that are meeting in Quetta, in Baluchistan, in Pakistani territory, that includes Malomar and includes several other top leaders, and that they're sort of scheming. Then you also have, you know, the, the rise of Betullah Massoud in South Waziristan over the course of the past year, and his... Um, you know, he, he seems whether it was just whether it was just well placed propaganda or whatnot. You know, there was the story that Mullah Omar sort of disowned him several months ago. What could you just talk a little bit about about the orchestration and organization between the Tariq Taliban Pakistan, that being the Pakistani Taliban, and the neo Taliban in Afghanistan? What is what do you see being the, the institutional linkages, the logistical, etc.? I wish I knew. If I knew exactly what happened, I, I, I was I was being uh, funny. I would have said that you know some people in Pakistan may know it, but uh, I, I I don't think anybody really knows. Yeah. You know, let us say let me t- say those one thing. If today Mullah Omar fell dead, just died or whatever, mm-hmm. nothing would change on the ground yeah. in my view. Yeah. This is this is how how this decentralized and, 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 and personalities are not that important. Mm. You have people like Dadullah, you know, the, the cover of our book, I think, uh, it, it has a Mullah Hayatullah in it. He's, he's a, a person who was with Dadullah, mm. the, the fam- infamous hit chopper. Mm. Uh, he was important in, in a sense that because he was a commander who had more than you know more than five six people around him, he became very unfortunately famous through the media because they made him into a, a you know a what he wanted was he got he got a lot of attention. Uh, but but when you look at Omola Omar, the ideology that comes down is really. Uh, I, I don't even know if the Mullah Omar is writing this ideology or is coming through him or it's it somebody from, from the Pakistan side, not, I'm saying government, but uh, people from the TTP yeah. sending them ideology. It's very fluid, which makes it so much harder to confront it. Mm. Uh, I wish I knew. I, I mean, I, I, in, in my chapter, I think I do go and, and give the names of, of the shuras that were announced. You know, w- w- the reason I go through that is, is uh, because that is what Put them on the map again. You have you have the notion that there was this uh, initial shura of ten people, and then that Mullah Omar appointed uh, individuals to ca- take care of certain provinces of Afghanistan. Do I buy that fully? I don't. I really don't know mm. because because uh, the way they fight doesn't seem to indicate that there is a a collective command and control or the shura that protect. You know that directs them. Maybe the Shura directs only groups in, in, in uh, say, Helmand, mm. Nimrod, uh, so, and, uh, and say Kandahar, uh, Kandahar and Zabul and, and Uruzgan. But then, when you deal with, with with groups in eastern Afghanistan, that's a whole different issue. There, I think you have much more foreign, yeah. and I mean non-Pakistani hands. Right. And then, when you go up north, uh, northeast in Konar Valley. Uh, and you go to, uh, you know, Konar, there's a whole different group of them. I don't think there's any connection. Uh, connection is because they all have videotapes and, you know, they talk to each other, but, or they learn from each other or from their uh, Iraqi friends, which lo- no longer you see that. Do you think that their ambitions are all the same? 
I don't think so. I, I, I think that the ambitions of each group within the African borderline. Well, are, I mean, and, the ambitions of if you if you were to, to generalize on say the ambitions of, of the Pakistani Taliban, the Afghan Taliban. I mean, do you think? Do you think that it's all to take over Afghanistan? I mean, people make the notion that the Taliban are trying to take over Afghanistan and Pakistan. While, while I think that the Taliban, from from my conversations with militants on the Pakistani side of the border, that the Taliban, their ambitions, they feel like Afghanistan is rightfully theirs. So that that, that is certainly part of the agenda. But I, I, I've never gotten the sense that, that the Pakistani Taliban were ready to jump into Toyota pickup trucks and take off for Islamabad and take over the government there. I, I agree with you. I think that Afghanistan Taliban, let's, 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 let's go from different groups. The Afghan Taliban, they believe that they are the one group within them. This is a group that you see a lot of, they have their own newspaper now, the Torah Bora, and uh, they think that, as you said rightfully in my view, that they are the rightful rulers of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. They made mistakes, but Afghanistan, by the way, let's not forget the name Afghanistan is an exclusive name, it's not inclusive. Mm -hmm. Afghan and if you go to Afghanistan and you say you're an Afghan, that means you're a Pashtun. Mm -hmm. Afghan and Pashtun are synonymous. Mm -hmm. This name does not officially include, although by constitution it does, the Tajiks, Hazaras, anybody else. It is the land of the Afghans, mm -hmm. i.e. land of the Pashtuns. Mm -hmm. And they believe in that. And that's why they see Karzai as a usurper, as a puppet in the hands of the northern people. Right. That's, that's it. So there are people who believe that the Taliban are the ones who represent the the, the ascendancy of Pashtuns again. Mm. Uh, secondly, I think there is a notion that the Islam in Afghanistan, but the Taliban did, a lot of people still speculate where it came from. Part of it did keep coming of things that were popular religion in Afghanistan. You know, people don't like to talk about these things, but that was the reality. Such as? such as, you know, throwing a wall over homosexuals. It was not that homosexuality did not happen. And, 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 and Kandahar is very obvious, yeah, everywhere yeah. it's obvious. But at the same time, it was something that was, the opposition to it was people, you know, putting walls on them or, or putting patches on Hindus. Well, let me, let me share a quick, quick um, anecdote about homosexuality that I found to be extremely funny. And I, and I heard from people from all over the Pashtun areas of Pakistan and Afghanistan. I was down in Banu, um, probably almost two and a half years ago. And someone said, look, you've got to be very careful in Bundu. You know, you're a very fair-skinned young man. <laughs> yes, exactly. And they said that even the pigeons fly over Bundu with only one wing, and they hold the other wing over their tail. And I, I have heard the same thing on well, Kandahar. That's the thing, and then I went somewhere else, and someone from Kandahar told me, hey, have you ever heard the story about the pigeons in Kandahar? And yeah, then yeah, someone yeah, told yeah. me the same story about, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it seems to be fairly a, a ubiquitous joke throughout the Pashtun areas. Yes, it is. And, and actually, homosexuality in Afghanistan, the place that is the most obvious is in the north, but people don't talk about right. it. So, or, or, or the issue of, of uh, you know, the, 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 or, you know, the veiling of women, these have been there. The issue of, 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 of what, they, what, what they made a mistake, in my view, is banning things like kite flying or, right. or attacking, dog fighting. Uh, not that I'm for dog fighting, uh, but, but those were traditions that were accepted. Right. Uh, you know, putting patches on Hindus, people forget that Afghanistan in the 1880s they had put, put patches on Hindus. Right. You know, it's not nothing new. Hindus had to wear certain colors. They couldn't even wear white turbans. They had to put yellow on them. Uh, so there is a, a, a historical understanding in Afghanistan that things were so amazingly. Afghanistan was just kind of a Norway, and suddenly these Taliban came in and destroyed all of that. And now, we, you know, Afghanistan had not jilled as a country in the sense of, of learning. You know, it was not a democracy. It was not a very advanced society in the Western sense. It was moving along. And the Taliban came in. Some of them were uneducated, and they believed in things that were not believed in the cities of Kabul and Herat and and, and, and Mazar -e Sharif, but it was a rural belief, kind of mixed with a lot of Islamism which came in from the Arabs. Mm -hmm. And this is where the difference comes in. The Arabs, and I call Arabs all the you know Chechens and all the, I think they have a notion which is much more sinister and much bigger. Uh, people like Zawahili, in my view, Zawahili is not interested in Iraq. Zawahili is definitely not interested in Afghanistan. Zawahili's interest, in my view, is Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And to basically eventually, and I have been saying this for a while, is to 
and this is why I think Zawahiri was not happy when Zarqawi was cutting heads of the Shia and other people because it was distracting people from his long-term goal. His long-term goal is, in my view, is one of his long-term goals is to cultivate enough support within the Pakistani military that one day, one day, the Pakistani military has enough supporters of his ideology, not he himself. I don't think he cares to become the head of anything. Right. Or become the the you know this Khalifa and have a Khalafat, which right. is Islam from all over the world. I think he wants to he that you know he wants to eventually have a Pakistan which is sympathetic to his ideology, and then after all, they get a coup or somebody in Pakistan that is towards you know has inclinations towards his views, and they come to power, and then they basically get their atomic weapon. Mm-hmm. I think it's a much more sinister, much more long-term, and it doesn't look at the Afghan ideology. And this is where I think a lot of people who, the, the Pashtuns, are seeing, you know, Mullah Omar, they, those who actually even sympathize with him, they say he made a mistake going along with, with people like bin Laden. If he had stayed with, as a Pashtun and as an Afghan, he would have gained the country and it would have been nice. Mm. Uh, yet also another thing, again, we are talking about if those who know Pashtun traditions, Mullah Omar has become a hero. Even for those people who never cared about neither the Islamists nor this whole pan-Islamic uh, ideology of the fact that, whether he did it for that reason or not, immaterial, the fact that he, Mullah Omar, gave up his kingship by, you know, basically his rulership, right and his house in order to protect the guest. Right. Which goes to the core of the Pashtun tradition. You protect your guest at the price of your life. He has become a thing of a legend. He is a man who knew that the United States would destroy his country, but he did not give up Bin Laden. You know, Laden. Whether he would have been protected or not, that's all immaterial. He has become a legend. Right. Well, let me, you know, one of the things, Imran Khan, the, uh, the, the member of, former member of the National Assembly in Pakistan, um, who prides himself on his sort of Pashtun roots, even though he was born in Myanmar in Punjab, but nonetheless is, is you know, is a Pashtun himself. He, um, he describes what the, the insurgency in Pakistan, the instability in Pakistan, is not being, quote-unquote, Talibanization, which is the, the term that, that a number of, of Western sources and the government tends to use to describe the phenomenon of, uh, of the Islamist insurgency, but he describes it as being a, a Pashtun uprising. Now, if you look at the, the United Nations map that they make of Afghanistan also, and it shows the sort of the, the areas that are no-go areas and the instability, it seems to reflect almost exactly where the Pashtuns are located. My question is, how much, how much of, of what we're seeing right now is, in fact, a Pashtun rebellion, and how much of it is, is a Taliban insurgency? Uh Partly they're one and the same. As I said, the nationalistic <coughs> idea, this is why the, the Taliban do get support from public who are not interested in, in bringing a very stringent Islam. They may even have their own you know, homosexual relationship. They may fly kites. They do whatever that the Taliban initially opposed, the old Taliban. Mm. But they see this neo-Taliban the resurgence as a way to bring Pashtuns back to ascendancy. Mm. So, yes, there is an issue. Mm-hmm. The other issue is, uh, if you look at the maps, those areas are not only Pashtun, you're right, but they also have another thing. On the other side of it is, is Pakistan. Mm-hmm. Wherever it's away from Pakistan, there is very little insurgency because it's partially because they have a place to go and get you know, get these supplies and also have an ideological background, an ideological home base, which is on the other side. Uh, I think this is where the Pakistani Taliban and the Afghan Taliban are merging and where Islamabad wants that merger to not exist because Islamabad's biggest fear would be a rise in Pashtunism, which is not Islamist. Mm -hmm. And this is where I think that Islamism is being supported indirectly, officially by, by, uh, by some people in Pakistan because of the fear that what you just say that Imran Khan is, is correct, uh, that there is a resurgence of Pashtunism, mm-hmm. that would not be, for, for people outside of that, Af, you know, Afghanistan, Pakistan, that may not be a big deal, you know, so what? The Pashtuns rise up and, and they, you know, it's a nationalist ideology, but the Pashtun nationalism is not bound only by Afghanistan. Right. 
if it rises up, it means going into Pakistan. Again, you know, with this new election in Pakistan, you keep on hearing again that they're going to change the name of Northwest Frontier Province to Pakhtunkhwa or, or uh, Pashtunistan, yeah. which, is, which is the name that Afghanistan uses it. Uh, and of course, that also is not the issue of, of the Pashtuns, because the Pashtuns somehow always, uh, whether the Baluchis want to do it or not, they include Baluchis with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, of course, that's another whole Pandora's box in the Pakistani issue, is what you're going to do with the Baluchis. Right. Uh, the Baluchis don't see themselves as Pashtun, mm-hmm. but they are, of course, uh, of all the four provinces in Pakistan, they are the least developed, the least, the most uh, disenfranchised in Pakistan. And, and on the other side of the border, the Baluchis are sort of intermingled with the Pashtuns in Nimruz and Farah and, and southern Afghanistan as well, if I'm not mistaken. And they are, yes. So, and Afghanistan has very little Pashtuns in, in numbers, but... but in, no, little, little Baluchis. Uh, sorry, I, 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 uh, yeah, little Baluchis in numbers, right. but they are, they are, and and and, uh, and that's why we, you know, the book again, uh, we were very uh, actually happy to include uh, a whole chapter on on uh, on uh, Lutz's chapter yeah. on uh, Nimrod. He was not in the. It's one of the two papers that was not a part of the conference. But uh, the Baluchis in Afghanistan are never looked at, and Baluchis, of course, have another whole issue, which is they are. They're an Iran too, uh, and and you know people keep on talking about Kurds and about nationalism. Here's a you know like the Kurds, there's a people who are very distinct. Right. They have their own history. They have had actually uh, governance. Uh, they are very ancient people, ancient tradition, and they do not have a state. Right. Uh, and and if you start talking about those things, then if you have Baluchistan, that will take whole chunk of Iran and and. Uh, a major chunk of Pakistan and a smaller chunk of Afghanistan. Let me, let me, we're coming up at about 52 minutes here, so let me ask you one final question. And that is that of all of the areas right now, in, if, if Pakistan, Afghanistan, the United States were all to be able, and, and ISAF, were all to be able to see eye to eye on, on strategic imperatives and be able to start stemming the, this uh, and, and start sort of rolling back this insurgency, what do you see geographically as being the area that would be most difficult to drive Taliban and to drive the militants out of, whether that be South Waziristan, Helmand, Kandahar, etc.? Well, uh, if you include both both, both sides, sides. I, I, I would think I would think the Fatah, South Waziristan, North Waziristan will be the most difficult mm-hmm. by far, you know, for, for various reasons, but that will be the most difficult. And and uh, I think, you know, when you, whenever you think about Counterinsurgency. We have to think about it, uh, development in the areas as well. Right. And 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 if development comes in in areas like Kandahar and even Khost and and, and we, we look, people don't look at successes. Somehow the media always mm-hmm. likes to look at, at failures or problems. But look at Nangarhar. Mm-hmm. Look at look at even Khost. Mm-hmm. Look at Paktika. Uh, there's a lot of uh, positive developments there. Uh, in Afghanistan, I think the the, the, the problem, the, the last provinces that you'll have problem with will be Helmand and Kandahar, and partially in Helmand is because of the drugs. Mm-hmm. I am one who thinks that the, the relationship of these phenomena are very close, uh, and but but I still think because of history, because of the history of governance in Afghanistan, as weak as it was, the history of of notion that Kandahar is kind of the cradle of Pashtun civilization and Pashtun ru- rulership, gives it more. A way, if, if they see themselves part of the system, there will be more people coming on board, whereas Waziristan still sees itself as occupied territory by a right. country that they don't see as their own. So I think that will be a, a bigger challenge uh, and more problematic. And by the way, our book is number four in Pakistan. Really? And, and I, I just came from a trip from Pakistan. It was everywhere next to Bhutan. Nice. Yeah, Buto is number one, and we are number four. Congratulations, that's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I mean, thanks so much for coming up to New America today. I mean, I, I learned a great deal, and I hope that our, our uh, um, viewers will as well. But I really, really appreciate it, and perhaps we can continue this discussion sometime down sure, the line. Sure, by all means. Thank you so much for having me. All right, me. thanks a bunch. Take Bye-bye. care.